Hi, folks. Uh, my name is Matt zoller -Seitz. I'm the television critic for New York Magazine and Vulture and the editor-in-chief of RogerEbert.com. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, we have a guest here with us, as you well know, Mr. Brian Cranston. How's everybody doing? So you watch The Fly and, and what else? Uh, Phoenix. Phoenix. Remind me what Phoenix is. Well, you, <laughs> they, uh, I didn't realize it until I was looking at them, but they kind of weirdly mirror each other. They both have the, ba the baby lullaby while you're watching the elephants, and then later you talk about that in Fly. In search of the perfect moment. Oh right. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to forgive me, but but and I'll need your help to to refresh my memory of uh, of the specifics of each episode. Well, Truly. we we have a whole room full of people who I think probably could <laughs> quote this entire series chapter and verse. So I think you're in good hands. Good. Uh, I want to start oddly enough by asking you about uh, Malcolm in the Middle, because. We're not going to do a, a 45 minutes of Malcolm in the Middle questions, unless you want to. Um, but because, oh, all right. Um, Vince Gilligan, uh, I interviewed him right before the pilot aired. And uh, I expressed some surprise, forgetting your role in the X-Files, that you were playing this particular part. And he said, what people don't know about Brian Cranston is that, and he had known you, has known you for a very long time, said he was always known as more of a Robert De Niro, Al Pacino type of actor. Do you think that's accurate? Do you know why he would say that's, that? That's high praise. Um, I, I suppose that I've always felt more comfortable in, in a character skin than a, than a quote unquote leading man type of thing. I don't know, because I, I think they're more fun to play. They're, they're usually uh, more creative and give you an opportunity to show different colors and that sort of thing. I guess I do gravitate toward that. I think maybe he meant more in terms of the intensity. Aha! Yeah. Uh, and the darkness. Really? Intensity and darkness. Okay. Um, you know, I, and I know there's a lot of actors. How many actors are here tonight, by the way? It's a, a fair amount, right? Don't be sure. Actors are shy. <laughs> <laughs> um... You know, uh, an actor's life is um, is a great one. I've had a fantastic life. I, I decided to become an actor when I was 22 years old, uh, professionally, and um, and I haven't looked back since. And I've been able to make a living as an actor, and that's my greatest pride in in this business. Um, but you know, you're talking about intensity and that sort of thing. I mean, an actor. Like a human being, you want to be able to display all kinds of emotions. You don't want to be the person known as, they're always giddy. Yeah, they're just, they're, they're just giddy all the time. And it's like, I don't want to be the giddy person. I also want to have some depth and some pathos and some humor and some sadness and some melancholy and some greatness and some fervor and, I mean, all kinds of things, right? Um, and so you look for that than those opportunities as an actor. So if, you, if you've been playing a certain type of character um, and you get really comfortable with it, that's fine. But for me, it's always been, when I was in an act, acting classes, and I've been in many, uh, if I felt that I was getting to the point where I was getting comfortable, it was time for me to leave. Uh, I needed to be in a, in, a, in a scenario that was slightly uncomfortable and that I'm not the best actor in the room. Uh, I, don't, I never wanted to have that, and so I would, as soon as it felt like something like that was happening, out I go. As opposed to, hey, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> I'm king of the acting class, you know? It's like, who wants that, right? And, but and, but and you, get to show a lot of, you get to show all those colorations in this role, and in fact, I, I, I was thinking about the first time that I was ever in the same room with you was a Television Critics Association gave you an award 10 or 12 years ago, I think, for Malcolm in the Middle. And uh, Dick Van Dyke was given a Lifetime Achievement Award the same night. 
He got the award before Brian Cranston received his award, and Dick Van Dyke said, what an honor it was to be in the same room with Brian Cranston. And I paused a moment because I recognized the name, <laughs> but it didn't register. <laughs> I was like, it was, it was that bit of absurdity, yes. you know, and he's, he, well, he's a very gracious man, and and a sweet guy and a, and a, a mentor of mine, you know. So. And, you, and you get to, but you watching the fl uh, watching fly, you you are bringing those skills to it, and you have that's in within the same episode. You're doing this uh, almost silent film, physical <laughs> comedy, uh, which is uh, very exciting and but funny. And then uh, later in the episode, you have this incredible one take scene where you're talking about the perfect moment, and you're in search of that elusive perfect yeah. moment, and it's very very dark and sad. Yeah, almost unbearable. That's the writing, folks. Uh, I can tell you the, the, the best lesson th that I've ever learned uh, f as an actor for my career is always follow the well-written word. It will never fail you. Whatever production you may be in may not necessarily be ultimately, quote unquote, a success. Uh, the film role may not be a hit at the box office, but fuck that. Who cares about that stuff? It's not, that's not your job to worry about those things. It's to focus on, on that work. And it's always about the writing. I, have, I know that as sure as I'm sitting here. When I, when I decide to do a, a film or a play or whatever, the first thing I look for is the overall story. How compelling is it? How rich is it? How important is it? Does it make a social statement? What, where in, in line does this you know, rest? The next is the text. Uh, it's either the script or the, the play itself. Uh, and they're not the same. Make the distinction between those things. Because sometimes you can have a great story, it's just not fully realized by the, the script. It just didn't quite hit it. Or, the script was fantastic, and I didn't think the story was going to be so good, and all of a sudden, now it's clear to me. So you're not, uh, I've interviewed actors who have told me flat out that they don't really care that much about the totality of the script. They, they are only interested in their character. And they I are fools. <laughs> <laughs> They're fools. Yeah. I'm, uh, trust me on this, you'll save yourself a hurdle if you uh, focus on the, on the overall storytelling. This is a component that we have enjoyed since the beginning of, of our memories, dragging a book to our parents, asking them to read us something. We have always wanted to be told a good story. And then, if you're lucky, you can become a storyteller as well as a story listener. And that's where we are. And that's the best life in the world. This is a, uh, this is a show that perhaps more dependent it's more dependent than most on story and story beats and on what happens next. And in fact, it's almost a, a, a mania for people to figure out what's going to happen next and to guess what's going to happen next on this show. And it's, and it's a pleasure to say that almost every time you, you get something different than what you thought, but it's as good or better than what you imagined. It is. When, when I and, and the rest of the cast read these scripts, and I... Uh, in the very first season, first two or three episodes, I decided not to read ahead. I only read about five days before we started shooting. And the reason was, is because of the twists and turns that this character takes. Um, you, I started to realize that if I knew two or three episodes down the road, I would misinform the moment in, that I was shooting a specific scene. And it didn't help me at all. And the, the twists and turns of Walter White were so great and, and, and rapid. And, and, and but, but, you don't feel that, but you don't feel that you're denying yourself anything by not knowing even a little bit in advance of what's going to happen? Not at all. No. My character didn't know anything. <laughs> he didn't know if he was going to be alive the next week, the next hour. Yes. So it didn't... It didn't it didn't behoove me as an actor to know too far in advance. Why? Uh, all, all I had to do was understand him and what his, what his intentions were and what he wanted 
and how he could go after that and who, who was presenting uh, an obstacle to that. Well, let's talk about Walter White a little bit then because uh, I've been writing, I've been revisiting the show and writing about the show and one of the subjects that has been obsessing me as well as the readers is a question of the relationship between Walter White and Heisenberg. And it seems kind of Jekyll and Hyde in some ways and it almost seems like a, a demonic possession in some ways and then also like a puppet and a puppet master, but then you get into the question of who's the puppet and who's the puppet master. Mm. Let's talk about that a little bit. Do you have any theories about that? Is there anything conscious or premeditated about the way you approach that? Um, the, I, I think I have to go back a little bit because um, wh when, I, when I take on a character, I look for uh, an emotional core of, of the character. What, what, is, what is it that he mostly lives in? What is the, the main emotion that he... Uh, occupies his time. And, um, you know, going back to Malcolm in the Middle, uh, Hal was fearful. He lived in fear. He was afraid of being a poor dad, uh, of, of his wife, you know, not appreciating him, of uh, losing his job. He was afraid of heights. He was afraid of spiders. He was afraid of everything, <laughs> which lent itself to humorous moments, but also was a very real, honest emotion for this guy. So that was what I hung on to, is that and then, and then when I re would read the scripts, I would read it through that filter that it went, went in there and pretty soon the writers picked up on that and they started writing toward that and it was a, it's a good marriage. And then when I slip on my tidy whities then I knew that uh, he was afraid of that too. Was that, that, uh, was that your idea? No, uh, that was written into, the, into both scripts actually. Yeah. It, it, was, uh, it was, it was, for some reason, um, the, the show creators <laughs> wrote Tidy Whitey in there, and I thought, all right, and I had my pick. I had all, you know, going through wardrobe calls, and you have every kind of underwear possible, and <laughs> tried on Spanx, and I tried on uh, a G-string, and that didn't quite work. Um, no, it's, it, so the, the most important thing is to honor the text, and there's a reason he wrote it, even, and both, uh, Linwood Boomer from uh, uh, Malcolm in the Middle and, and Vince Gilligan uh, said, oh yeah, I don't know, uh, yeah, I just thought, it was, I don't know, yeah, whatever you want to pick, you know. But there's a reason for it, and sometimes the writer, he or herself, don't entirely know that reason. But there's a reason for it, so it's up to us to start looking for that reason. Well, let's return for a second to a thread that you were approaching earlier, which is the question of the core. Yeah. The core of the character. You talked about the core of Hal. Right. What, what do you think is the core of Walter? Ah. Well, looking for it, I had the hardest time finding where Walter lived. I couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find it. And all of a sudden, I was in a, co a conversation at dinner once, and someone was talking about depression. And I went, whoop, there it is. That's what happened to him. He, he was de a depressed man from missed opportunities. And f over the years, now he's 50, over the years of his entire adult life, missed opportunities, he would just gloss over, gloss over, just keep squishing it down, squishing it down, squishing it down. Basically, in some of the research I did on depression, broad strokes, obviously psychology majors will go, but in broad strokes, it, it manifests in, in two main ways. One, you explode and blame everyone for your misfortune. My ex-wife and my boss screwed me and that guy did this and, you know, and basically it's coming from inner turmoil. Or you implode and that's what happened to Walter White. He just became invisible to himself, to society. He imploded and he, that's why when that, and once I caught on to that, that informed everything. Then I went to Vince and I said he should be, you know, 10, 12, 14 pounds overweight. Uh, he should have uh, no color in his hair or his face. We want to have clothes that, that match the, the wall. So he's, he's unremarkable in every way. And uh, a mustache that people look at and go, <laughs> <laughs> either grow it or shave it. What, what do you, you know, just you scratch your head over it. And so I thought, I said, I want to look like a, uh, a, an impotent mustache, you know, and, and a, a, a caterpillar on, on the limb. Um, so once I found that, everything, everything changed. And now what I realized is that as the show went on, what happened to Walter White is that he took a stick of dynamite to that 
calloused over core of emotion, and it blew up because, and that's why, as you'll see, as, this, as the series went on, he became very clumsy with his emotions and became very careless and impulsive. He completely changed from that measured, methodical uh, scientist that he was to this man who has taken over his, his life. I'm, I'm intrigued by your mentioning depression and your research into depression because uh, this show has often been compared to The Sopranos, uh, What Great Drama Isn't. But there's a line in The Sopranos, Dr. Melfi says, depression is anger turned inward. And uh, of course, the converse could be true as well. That's probably where I got it from. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, and, yeah. you know, I mean, our, our whole lives we're, we're recording, right? And you're recording. You don't necessarily know where where an idea came from. And I certainly don't claim to say, "Aha! I've just created a new." <laughs> you know, but we're, you're open and listening, and I was deeply searching for that answer. Thank you. So he's projecting that he's projecting that depression outward. And uh, which brings us to the famous quote by, Gwen, by Vince Gilligan that this is uh, Mr. Chips becoming Scarface. Mm. So in the course of rewatching this show and in talking about the show with fans of the show, the question poses itself, is this really about Mr. Chips turning into Scarface? Or was, in fact, Scarface posing as Mr. Chips the whole time? Uh, well, I mean, I think that's a, that's a colorful sound bite. But in reality... Uh, w w <laughs> Mr. Chips wasn't as depressed. I mean, uh, he was a very jolly fellow, you know. So, um, we, no, we, we meet Walter White. He's already in the middle of his crisis, and uh, he doesn't even know it. He's Willie Loman in some ways. He's, he's Willie Loman in many ways, actually, yes. And um, putting one foot in front of the other, keeping some kind of spirit alive, hoping that... Uh, Things will change. He's a responsible man. He loves his wife. He has a special needs son. He's, he's willing to work that second job for his therapy. Uh, he's, he's humiliated. Um, he's embarrassed. Uh, he's guilty. And, and, and I asked Vince once, I said, why is he a teacher? I don't know. I just thought it would, because uh, my mother was a teacher. And, uh, you know, I was like, <laughs> again. And now I said, okay, but there's a reason. There's a reason. And I started thinking about it, started thinking about it, and I went, Aha. And these are these are backstories. For for those of you who are not actors, or actors write backstories to the to their characters that is that it's not given in a text. And it just helps us to create a foundation so that we feel more comfortable. The more comfortable we feel in knowing a character, truly knowing a character, the better we uh, act. The, the more we can draw from, and it all filters through that. So uh, I thought, oh, this is perfect. If a man is depressed for missed opportunities, feeling guilty about his life, imploding, uh, what profession would you take? If he chose this brilliant chemist, if he chose to become a truck driver, what would the reaction be to his friends, from his colleagues, and everybody? What the hell are you doing? You're wasting your brain, your God-given talent. No one can criticize becoming a teacher. So even though it wasn't necessarily meant for him, he was hiding out in academia. Immunizing himself against criticism. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. A better way to put it. Is there, uh, I, I guess, the, the Mr. Chips to Scarface journey then, the question is more about um, was this guy hiding in him the whole time? In other words, is it more of the genie being let out of the bottle by the cancer diagnosis or by that trauma? Because anger and violence and treachery seem to come very, very easily to Walter. Yeah. For somebody who hasn't been called upon to practice those things before he became Heisenberg. I don't know if I agree with that. I think he went through a transition that was uh, very tormenting. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, but he, but my, my theory is this, and uh, again, it, this is all, we, all open for discussion, but for me, playing a character, it's important to zero in on what you think it is. And I've only been, I've asked, been asked this question, so I, I start thinking about it from an objective viewpoint. And my feeling is, is that each and every person, every person in this room could become dangerous given the right set of circumstances. Every human being has a full spectrum of emotions available to us. Some are not realized, some will never be tapped into. 
But given the right set of circumstances and conditions and despair or, or depression, you may get there. Has anyone ever heard the term seeing red? You have? Uh, in my generation, it was, it was deemed as you blow your top. You go temporarily insane. So that, that uh, plea of temporary insanity is a very real thing. When you feel like you're, you could hurt yourself or hurt someone else, in a moment, in a flash, a couple things fell into place that were really horrible and you blew your top. And you, for that moment, you became very dangerous. It's a very real thing. And so if those issues are compounded or consistent and reoccurring, a condition changes in a human being and they start getting into that more and more. Well, Walter White made this decision and he had to create a lie to back up that decision. And he had to create another lie to back up that first lie and so on and pretty soon, he's a pretty good liar because he needed to develop that skill set you know, he was a, he was a, from academia, he was, it, it, everything made sense, you well, know, and now he's in a world that didn't make sense, but he had to make sense of it somehow and quickly. He, he is, uh, but he is also in a way a performer as a teacher too. And the first time that we see him, he's, he's essentially delivering a, a monologue. Yeah. And he's looking for the metaphors in science. Um, but to talk about anger for a second, anger management is one of the things that's, uh, that makes Walter funny as well as scary. Because it's almost a, a motif in the show that he'll get into situations where he's confronting someone and it would be in his best interest to simply walk away having said his piece. But he always, he'll, and they'll often stage it the same way on the show. He'll start to walk out of the room having gotten what he wants and then he just can't let it go. Mm -hmm. He just can't let it go. That's that impulsivity that started to creep in. Uh, there's been comments. Uh, I, can I assume everybody is, is caught up uh, with 508? Um, some of you may be wondering, why? How can this man leave leaves of grass on the back, back of the toilet? I wondered that. It's really very simple. He became impulsive. He became a different person. He became a person who wasn't anywhere near as careful as he was when we first met him. And it's, an, it's indicative of, of what's happened to his life. Look what he did with Mike. That was ego. That was anger. That was, he, he tried to put me in my place and tell me if I just knew, kept in my place. And, and, and it got to him, his hubris. Right, so what we discover all along this track, and, and Vince and I had these long discussions before we even started. I said, I don't want to just have it become a, a physical transformation. I want it to be complete. I want it to be emotional and everything. Everything's dangerous about him. And he even, he even can't even, he, he doesn't even know why he did that. In fact, right after he shoots Mike, he's like, oh shit, 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 shit. You know, what do I do? And, and then trying to, trying to figure out how to take care of this, and of course, he's gonna end up in a barrel. He also, <laughs> he also has a different perception of himself than other people see, and I just rewatched watched an, the episode where he meets Gus Fring for the first time, mm. and he says to Gus, uh, essentially, you're somebody like me, I recognize the type, and you're meticulous, you're thoughtful, you, you know, you're in control of yourself, and Gus, with, uh, with, uh, without even taking a beat, says, you're not that guy at all. I don't know who you're talking about. That gap between who Walter thinks he is or who Heisenberg thinks he is, and it gets very confusing when you're trying to distinguish between those two because it almost seems like they, they f one of them ebbs and the other one flows. Yeah, and, and, and there is a distinction between the two. I think what, uh, there, was a, there was a moment in the, f in the second season uh, where he's uh, announced to be on remission and his diet is back and his hair is going to grow back, but he decides to shave his head anyway. And it was a little moment, but a very important moment because that, that said, no, I think, I'll, I think I've gotten used to this guy. And looking in the mirror and seeing a bald-headed man who he had never seen before, that 50 years old, uh, was in a way, if he didn't recognize the man in the mirror, somehow there's distance. Somehow there's, there's. So a, it's like he's giving. Him, he's like he's giving himself permission to be somebody else. 
or, or almost, yes, almost uh, give, allowing him to do what he needs to do. Um, and I think, I think he created Heisenberg because he needed a, a touchstone. He needed a talisman to be able to, uh, to create that alter ego. And that's where the pork pie hat came in for me. Anyway, I think, I think Vince was, I think it's just cool. He's from, <laughs> he's, Vince Gilligan, if you ever get a chance to meet, he's a great guy and a brilliant writer. And uh, he's from, from Farmville, Virginia. And, I, you know, he's never done a drug in his life. I just think it's cool that he's doing this, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but for me, I had to, you know, again, I, you have to make uh, reason for these things, for, for your actions. So everything that happens, you have, to, you have to justify it as a character. And sometimes it's tough because I'll get a script and I might be out and about or with my wife or something and I uh, sit down and I start to read it and I read it objectively and, and I read some things that are offensive, you know. I, I mean, God, he's acting. And then I have to just let that go and then read it as Walter White, you know, and, and allow myself to be that guy and to go down that path that no one would want to present to the public. Can we talk a little bit about the physical aspects of the, of the performance? Uh, in, in what do you do differently with your voice, with your body, when you're playing Heisenberg as opposed to when you're playing Walter? Uh, well, the body, body imagery was, was interesting, and I was, as I was thinking about this character, I, I, um, I realized that Walt it would carry a lot of grief and weight on his shoulders, and so I just physicalized that, and I looked at my dad, my dad's now 89 years old, and naturally his shoulders are more rounded and his posture isn't what it used to be, and I thought, that's like Walter White, I think so. So, so you'll notice that Walt is, is more like this, and he's more looking up, you know, at things, and his neck is kind of a little bent, and um, not in the, in the, in the best of, of shape, of course, and um, and for for Heisenberg, it wasn't it wasn't that difficult because what happens? We've all been in, and seen the beginnings of a fight, usually men. Uh, who? What's the first thing that that men do when they are angry and they want to present that to some other man? They puff out their chest, just like in nature. You see animals try to make themselves bigger, right? They make themselves bigger. Well, guys do the same thing. Oh, is that right? Is that right? You want to come? You want to go? You want to go? You know, right? And it's, it's a very dis instinctive thing for human beings to do, especially men, uh, to make themselves appear bigger than they really are. And the words are bigger. You want to go? I'll fucking nail you. You want to go? You know, and it's like, and, I, and they're hoping, please back down, plaque, back down, back down, please back down. Uh, and they're doing it so they make the, uh, try to make the other guy back down. Because they, in truth, in the heart of hearts, they don't want to fight. Because there's that little thing like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. You know, usually it's uh, uh, when they're f filled with adrenaline and testosterone and alcohol. That's a, that's a deadly chemistry mix there, isn't it? Um, and so for, for uh, Heisenberg, whenever he felt like he needed to m establish himself, and the first time was really in, in Tuco's lair when, with the fulminated mercury, you know, right. and, and he, he brought his chest out and, he, and he, his posture was better. He seemed taller. He seemed taller. He was taller. He stood up and, um, and he dropped his voice. So... so uh, Walter, when he first started, was had a voice that was more like this, and you know, chemistry is about change. You know, it's about chemicals, and and then uh, as he went on, his voice started dropping deeper and deeper and deeper, and then it became, "I am the danger," you know, and and, <laughs> and that was meant. That was the 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 vocal equivalent of sticking my chest out because I had to stop any particular aggression toward me. You know, so that's the. One, one more question for you from me, and then we're going to let the audience ask a few. Um, this character is so dark, and you probably have to go to so many very dark places to play him. Are you able to let go of him 
at the end of a shooting day or at the end of a season. Because I've talked to actors who have gone to this type of place who've said that it's difficult for them. It should be difficult. Uh, actors have to pay that price. Uh, the, the, the thing that makes us uh, unique as a, as a group is that uh, we not only are able to expose ourselves and be vulnerable, figuratively naked, literally naked to the world, we have to embrace that about us. And you know how it was in high school where we fought like hell to be the same as everybody else because we didn't want to be ridiculed or, or set apart or laughed at or different in any way, and then from there on you go, oh, what was I thinking? So actors, what, what you know, if I could, convey that to a young actor, a high school actor, it's like have the courage to be who you truly are and those who truly respect and, and are open to you will not point their finger at you but will embrace you and that's what happens. When, when you truly show vulnerability, you are embraced because we are human beings and we recognize when someone else is vulnerable. And that's, that is human nature and that's the wonderful thing about it. And actors have to be willing to go to those places and I think did Jane die in this episode, in one of these episodes you saw? Yeah. Um, well, that was brutal. Um, just a couple things about that. There was a, there, there, Vince, this is second season, and Vince wrote it to where Walt uh, was so angry at the, at the sight of, of his young boy, uh, Jesse, being now under the influence of heroin, this, this woman, this, this urchin, you know, is gonna kill him. And so he, she starts choking and he grabs, he takes her shoulder and pushes her back on her back so that she does choke to death, and she does. And the studio and the network went, whoa, whoa, no, 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 too soon, too soon, too soon. Now it's all subjective, isn't it? We know we're going to this good person to bad person, where where are the beats? Where do we make those twists and turns? And so they, they said, it's too soon, it's too soon. And I read that and I went, oh my God. There's no, there's no ifs, ands, or buts in that. He is a murderer, right? Um, so then he, he softened it, he sat back, and he had a different standpoint. And I chimed in and I said, I have an idea. Um, I said, what if... Um, I am so disgusted with uh, Jesse for doing this to himself, you know, that I try to shake him awake, and the jostling, as it turns out, flips her on her back, and I don't notice that. So then the first impulse, she starts choking. The first impulse is to help her. Oh my God, she's, someone's choking. And right before I can get to her, wait, this is the person who was blackmailing me and who would ruin everything and then the next beat is, but she's a, uh, she's a little girl. She could be my daughter. She's someone's daughter. She's just a, uh, but she is going to kill Jesse with this heroin. She, she will kill him. Look at him now. And, it, you know, so his, so his act of omission became enormous. And going, he's going through, going through all this stuff. And then she's choking and choking and choking. What should I do? What should I do? What should I, and she's gone. And then he catches himself like, oh my God, what have I done by not helping? And then a moment later, fuck it, move on. And on move that on. note. <laughs> so it's, it's, allowing, it's allowing yourself to go through those things and show, show ugliness. Allowing yourself, because it's right for the character to be there. And the, the, the one thing we have to do is to be honest and portray it honestly. And to me, you know, the, this, the amount of discussions that goes into all these things is intense and long, back and forth. You and mean among the writers or the actors? Or the everyone? actors and writers. I mean, actors know it's like it's a triumvirate. You have you, writers write it, and then the actors and a director, you take it up and you put it on its feet. You give it three dimensions. And when you do that, everything that was written really appears as it was. It's theoretical. And, and it, you can't just take a camera and shoot the script. It doesn't work that way. 
So when you actually get it up and it, it flows through the sensitivity of the, of the other uh, artist components, um, then it changes, things change. And it's, it's a fascinating experience. All the actors like, uh, I, I, can, I know are going, I know, and it's so great, it's so great, it's so much fun. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of hard work and it can be frustrating. So, uh, questions. Um, I don't think we have a mic in the house, do we, to, for that? Or okay, well, we'll you're just, just going we to have to. You'll just mic. have to project, or I'll repeat. You mean, yo, bitch. <laughs> uh, Aaron, the question was about Aaron Paul, um, who is a, a brilliant, brilliant actor and a dear, dear friend, and I, 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 f I love him. I feel like he's a. a my son in many ways, my little brother in many ways. Um, he's a man who is uh, uh, right there with you. And, and the thing that you hope for, it's not necessary when you, when you work with other actors, it's not necessary that you become friends and, and intimate and love each other. It just makes it easier. It's like in-laws. It's not essential, <laughs> but it makes it easier. Uh, so, uh, and, and Aaron is a, a, a terrific actor, and the, the, thing that, the thing that I, leading the cast, uh, as I did on, on Malcolm, because Jane didn't want to, um, uh, is to instill a sense of, of uh, humility and, and acceptance that we are the luckiest people in the world. Look at this, and I tried to tell the kids, teach the kids that, just like RJ on the show, and, and uh, you check in with the adults and make sure that there's no bullshit. We, I, don't, I don't allow any, any bullshit on a, on a set that I'm in charge of. It's, we're there to have fun and, and create art, and it's, it's, it's a joyous uh, uh, occasion, and I don't want to hear any bitching and complaining. There's frustration, and that's, that's absolutely allowed. Well, Aaron, is, he's right into that. He's so, at well, one time we were leaving, we were doing a scene, we are out in the desert and hot in, in Albuquerque and the wind was picking up and sand was in all of our noses and ears and eyes and, and we called lunch and we're sweating and it's stinging and we're trying to make up in the, ugh. And we're walking to lunch and he goes, <laughs> isn't this great? <laughs> and I said, my wish is that you always feel that way. Uh, the question was, uh, Walt's facing death, uh, that she heard that Vince Gilligan said that it was liberating for him, uh, for the character, uh, to, and that's what, what created that freedom to become this other person. And, and you were saying that you, you feel that it was the fear of death motivated. Well, uh, you saw in, in the pilot episode, if you can remember that one, there was, there was that moment in the, in the clothes store where this is after he got his, um, his uh, diagnosis of, of cancer. And, and there's, there's kids who were making fun of my son. And, and uh, I think that gave him the bravery to do that. Uh, you notice that Skyler wasn't surprised that, that uh, Walt was not around to, to stick up, uh, but she was damn well surprised when he came back in and and took care of business, and Walt saw the reaction that that Skyler had, and 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 that his son had. His son was was looking at him with pride, and his wife was like, "Wow," and uh, that's a good thing for a man to hear. It's a nice thing, and it it builds up his ego. And he had a very small ego at that time. He was still dealing on a very base scale there, and so all those every single moment in the pilot and every scene is there for a specific reason. Um, now, you, I, I guess you could say it, it did liberate him to some extent. Um, for me, playing Walt, it wasn't that I was uh, fearful of dying that motivated me to, to do what, what, what Walt decided to do to use his chemistry background, to make crystal meth, to make as much money for his family before he dies. That's what I held on to. This was, by God, if I'm gonna die, I wanna have something, something I could leave for my family. It was a very male thing. Is that when, it, when my daughter was born, 
it kind of kicks in a sense of responsibility. From that point on, I can take care of myself, and I can take care of my wife. You have a child, things change. And um, you want to feel that sense of pride and responsibility. You want to meet your responsibilities. And he th uh, I, I kept conjuring in my head. It never came, it, it was never spoken uh, to, the, to the writers to try to write this in. But for me, it was the sense of humiliation. He, he, he got a, a glimpse of what his last few weeks might be, that he would shrivel up into this little skeletal of a man. He would wet himself and not be able to feed himself. His wife would have to wipe his drool and empty his bedpan. He'd use up all the savings they ever had, have nothing, leave them penniless, and then die. And the impression that my little baby and my son, still impressionable, would be of a man who was sickly. Like the story Walt tells about his own father. I, yeah, I like that there. Yeah, that's a, that's a, good, a good example, is that. Um, and you don't, you know, so that, those are motivating factors to propel him to do something bold and risky for the first time in his life. Show's ending? Yeah, um, I'm very excited. Uh, I think, you know, I've, I've spent seven years on Malcolm in the Middle um, and six years doing this show. And I think I'm, I've, I, I have to step back. The, you know, the, Walter White's a very indelible character and, it, and it, it leaves a mark on you, you know, emotionally and physically and, and now in the zeitgeist of it all. And, I need to step back and not be so ubiquitous, and and uh, and I'm I realized what I wanted to do, and 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 I was very fortunate to be able to get what I had hoped, and um, I'm going up to Boston next week. I'm going to uh, start rehearsals for a play called All the Way, in which I'll be playing uh, President Lyndon Johnson, uh, which covers the first year of his presidency in 1960. Three, November 1963 to 1964. You're far too young to even know that. But this man is like King Lear. He was amazing. And the more I read about him and do research, the more I'm excited about playing this guy. It's going to be great. So we'll, we'll be up there if you want to come up. Uh, we'll be at ART in Boston uh, mid-September to mid-October. Uh, and th unfortunately, that's all the time we have, or, or so I've been signaled. Uh, yeah. Oh, you want to keep going? We can go a little bit. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Brian Cranston. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. You know, I'm I uh, I'm not uh, I leave uh, impulses for my work. Uh, I'm very different in my in my personal life. I develop a, a real solid foundation. Been married for a long time. I feel that if I can um, if I can if my, if I can create my real life as sanely as possible, it allows me to go as insane as I want because I always have that tether to a, a foundation, to, to reality. And um, there are moments, though, in my real life when, I, when I'll you know, uh, act on an impulse. And this was an impulse that I wanted to do because we're the very last day of shooting, uh, very last day of the very last uh, episode of, of Breaking Bad. And we, went all to, we all went to a, uh, a bar to have a drink. And there were a lot of crew members who were talking about getting tattoos, and one of our art department guys who was a tattoo artist. And Richard was going to bring his tools, his needles and paints, to the bar. <laughs> and everybody's, ah, I'm going to get this. I'm gonna, and guys got big things on their ass and their arms and all over the place. And I thought, OK, I'm going to get a tattoo. I'm going to shock the hell out of my wife uh, <laughs> and get a tattoo. I, I don't have a tattoo except this one. and. Um, but I'm also an actor, and I don't want to put, I don't want to mark something that I have to constantly cover up or something. So I designed a, an idea, and I got the logo, 
much smaller than that. Um, and I, I uh, put it in a place where I see it because it was for me. It's not to present it to the world, it's for me. When I catch a glimpse of it, it reminds me of, of the six years, this great character that I've played, and uh, I'm really proud of it. Next question. You're not no. gonna, <laughs> you're not gonna tell yeah, us where it is, right? It's right, right here. here. Okay. It's right there, it's right between, it's in between my fingers, so you can't see it at all. And I'll reach and I'll catch it, and it's like, oh yeah. <laughs> I prefer to be in whatever's right for the character. I don't really care what I look like in real life. I honestly don't. I don't dress myself. My daughter dresses me. <laughs> it's true. I don't know how to dress myself. I'm so used to working that I walk into my closet and I go, ah, can't someone lay out clothes for me? It's so much easier just to, you know, this is what I'm wearing. But um, it's just not important to me. Uh, it's, it, it, but however, it is important. So, and actually, it, clothes do make a difference. And I feel, I feel good in, in nicely made clothes. Um, and, and as far as an actor's preparation, uh, it, it matters when in, in, if you're wearing a tuxedo or if you're wearing shorts, right? Um, so that, that's, I, I don't care, my hair go, comes and goes, my wife likes the hair. Uh, it does make me look older. It does make anyone look older if they don't have hair. Hair softens a face. So what we found, and uh, quite by accident, I knew I was going to shave my head when we were doing this, is that um, it also becomes the most intimidating look a man can have. Bald head, facial hair. Because when you have hair, it softens. It's like a frame, like a picture frame. It softens the picture. You know? I never in a million years thought I would be able to use this factoid, but uh, when I interviewed Vince Gilligan before the pilot came out, one of the things he said about you was that uh, you had this ability to completely shave, and then within a matter of maybe two or three weeks, he said you looked like the Unabomber. <laughs> he, said, he said that you grew hair faster than any man he had ever met in his life. <laughs> Is that true? I got a lot of testosterone in me. <laughs> Um, well, you know what it's like to grow. Uh, Next question. <laughs> uh, you, you imagine, you know, a, an actor uh, uses uh, the, the tools that you develop, right? Experience in your own personal life. And what you don't have in your ex experience, you you supplant with imagination. So if you're if you're good at doing that, you imagine certain scenarios about what this would be like for this man with this set of conditions in his life at that point. Um, he knew at when he blew up uh, Tuco's office that he needed to make a statement. He just felt in intuitively that if he didn't stand up for himself now, that this maniac would, would kill him. Uh, so he had to do something, but he wouldn't, he wouldn't go in empty-handed. So he had the ace in the hole for him, and Tuco didn't know what was coming. And um, the maniacal release, basically, is just that. It was, can you imagine, going into that office, you're, you're sitting on a, on a bundle of nerves, and you're, uh, there's a little bit of vibration going, and you're talking to yourself about how I'm going to do this, how I'm going to do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And there's a lot of adrenaline going on, and you're trying to calm yourself and deep breathing and whatever. And by the time you do it, and it was successful, oh, my God, that's, that's an amazing release. You know, you look at athletes, and at when they accomplish something, ah, you know, it's that, it's that. You know, there's, there's a lot of parallels through uh, acting and, and athletics, you know. So that's, that's one example. The, 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 uh, the crawl space thing, uh, you know, that, there's some, uh, some of it's technical because you do it over and over again. So you have to find how you can technically manipulate your body into allowing yourself to do that laughter, that deep guttural laughter. It's aided by the sensibility that of the absurdity of the moment. Not only can I not now take my own money 
and have my family disappear because, because Gus Fring is coming to kill us all. <sighs> Skylar gave it to her lover. <laughs> her lover! You know, I mean, it's like, and so you allow yourself to get into that insane reality and that maniacal laugh is supported. I say this often, but it, it, it's so true and it needs to be said. The hardest work an actor has ever done is on poorly written material. And the easiest work we've ever done is on well written material. And I don't want to say it's easy, but it's easier. It is easier work to do work that, that, that uh, Vince Gilligan writes or that Chris Terrio wrote for Argo. It's easier because the guideposts are there. It's all clear, and you see it, and you, d you don't have to justify your actions. You don't have to say, oh, great, what? this came out of left field. How is this possible? You, know, you don't have to try to manufacture and, and, and act when you know you don't believe what you're doing. And that's, what, that's when you see a performance or performances that you go, I don't, I don't believe them. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what's going on here. And you push away. You change the channel, or you fold your arms and look at the person in the movie theater next to you and go, is this crap or is this crap? You know? not, not deliberately seeking out unnecessary unhappiness or pain or, or chaos is kind of a motif in this conversation. I mean, the, the whole idea of a, an artist being tortured or unhappy in order to create, you, don't, you really don't believe in that. No, do God, you? no, no. No, but... Uh, a lot of young actors do, as oh, you know. Oh, well, that's, I, I think it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> I do. I, it's it's because it's a catharsis, really, when you are able to drop into someone. I actually, when when a character drops into you, it's even better. When a character, when you when you start out as a dry sponge to a character, and you learn more and more about them, and they you start to ingest the character. The character starts to come inside your body. Is uh, like the. Uh, the way you can describe it. And once it lives and has a residence inside you, you're home free. Mm -hmm. Then you just nurture that and make sure. Then every time a director gives you a note, and, and I have to t sometimes I have to tell directors or writers, it's like, when you give me a note, uh, I'm not saying no, I'm processing. So you're telling me something, do this, and it, can you go here and go there next and then stop there and pick that up and go? You know, it's like, and you, you have to see in process, this character, at this point, can he make this? Is it justifiable? Does it make sense? And, and you filter it. And then you have that discussion, whether you can or can't. You know. Um, you know, the joy of this is that Walter White, if you ask Walter, you know, <laughs> there's no joy in any of these things. <laughs> and that's, that's what's great about it, is that Walt, doesn't see himself as funny, doesn't see the situations funny. It's it, that the humor is organic and comes out of the conditions that the characters find themselves in. Uh, that being said, what was the funniest? Um, uh, there was a moment, uh, wh you remember four days out when, when we get caught in the, uh, we get, w Jesse doesn't turn off the, the, uh, the battery of the RV and we get stranded out there and literally out in the middle of nowhere without water and we're going to die if we don't fix this. And so um, we, we decide to, he, Walt gets this idea to make a battery. And he tries to teach his young squire to, uh, to, to be up on this, you know, you, you can do this now, you know, the, what, the, we need a conductor, right? And he goes, yeah, wire. And like, nah, nah. <laughs> you know, and, and, uh, and w this is funny because like it's it, an element. Yeah, like it's an element, yeah. yeah. And so um, uh, we, we got to a point, he, he, he said, can't we do something? Come on, you're smart, Mr. White. Can't we, you know, like make a robot or something? Uh, you know? And it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're even more of an idiot than I realized, you know? And then all of a sudden, he does get the idea of what to do to make that battery. And he realizes, if I have the components, do I have the components I need? I do, I do, I do, we can do this. All right, all right, this is what we can do. What can we do, what, what? I said, you said it yourself, a robot. <laughs> <laughs>
Now, what was interesting about that is that wasn't written. Um, and this is, this is all about being open. So there's a, a, a camera assistant named, uh, named uh, Rick Schuster. And um, Nick would say, uh, he said, hey, we finished the scene. The producers are going, we got we to gotta cut. We gotta, we're done for the day. We got to close it down. Let's go. Because uh, it's uh, you know, very costly. And Nick said, wouldn't it be funny if, uh, if he said a robot? you know, at the end, to give it that punch. And we thought, oh my God, that's gonna be hilarious. But appropriate for, for Jesse to say that. So we faked that there was a problem in the camera. <laughs> oh, no, wait, wait, we, the camera, the, you check the lens, yeah, no, 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 the gate's, the gate's dirty, we gotta do it again. We had a problem, ah, okay, one more time, one more time. And then we got that in on the very last take and he added, a robot? <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, you know it was rich because because it came from an unlikely source, but that's 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 what you have to be open to. Anyway, it was fun. Well, Thanks well, all. Thank you everybody. Thank you very much.